following interview was conducted with um, <laughs> Professor Emeritus uh, Douglas Sutton in structural engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. This is part two, and it takes place on Friday, November 9th, 2012, Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the former oral history librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Sutton, and thank you very much. Um, like let's, uh, anything further that you want to say on the Senate to, that to work that you were in there? That's kind of where we left off before. Uh, the University Senate was a good activity for me, and uh, somewhat of an eye-opener as to the problems that large modern universities have. There were times, uh, there were difficult issues to be resolved during that period, and I won't attempt to go through them all, but one of the things that was done was that we uh, uh, resolved the university calendar for an extended period of time. That was around 1990. Yeah, you were around 1991. 1990, so. 1991. Actually, I was involved for several years before that in chair of both educational policy and university resources policy committees uh, before I was vice chair of the Senate and then chair of the Senate. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there, were, there was a little turmoil, as there is today, frankly, about just how calendars should be configured. That discussion took place over several years, in fact, when I was on educational policy. Uh, there were extended discussions about this. Uh, the bottom line is that it came out with what I would call a reasonable approach. Uh, the, uh, the two holidays that complemented each other and seemed to complement each other resolved an issue that uh, with the King holiday as to whether it should be a holiday or just a special celebration day. It wound up a holiday and uh, since there's a Monday holiday in the fall semester, that seemed to balance out well. Also, the issue of Thanksgiving and how to handle that. Uh, there were there was some people that complained about uh, having classes on Wednesday immediately before Thanksgiving because so many of our students were at a distance, and so uh, that was resolved by making Wednesday a uh, a day off and, and extending the Thanksgiving holiday. The other thing, of course, was. Uh, shifting the beginning of the semester to uh, January so that uh, there was basically not an academic dead period immediately following Thanksgiving, immediately following Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I'm sorry, immediately preceding Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so uh, starting it in January made sense and ending it in May and uh, starting before uh, uh, Labor Day, it, 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 that was a problem for some people. They didn't, and, and it frankly still is for some people, I think, because it does have us going to school in the summer. Right. What about fall break? Were you, when you were on there, was that? When yes, that was implemented too. And, yeah. and you see, that was a balance that was possible. By making fall break Monday and Tuesday, and then having Thanksgiving Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that took up a full academic week. So it was possible to balance the semesters so that there was a Monday through a Saturday in each week of right. the semester. Right, exactly. Okay? Oh, okay. Let's talk about the School of Civil Engineering. There were a couple of heads that uh, during your tenure there. I think you said uh, Woods was the head when you came? or K.B. Woods was the head when I came, and uh, uh, Catherine Banks was the head when I left. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were several good leaders along the way. Uh, there was, uh, I would say, there was good collegiality in the school, uh, especially in the earlier years. I would say the the move in the American culture in general is to consolidate more power at the top and less uh, collegiality, and that's true of the universities. I think that's happened here. There's more top-down management. I don't think it's healthy for the universities, but it's not just Purdue. In fact, Purdue. I'm familiar with other schools, and Purdue was not as bad as some others when it comes right. to that. John McLaughlin was the head, and then he moved into administration, didn't he? Well, John McLaughlin basically was in administration a better part of his academic life. Uh -huh. uh, uh, very quickly got into it as a young man. He was uh, uh, a protege of K.B. Woods. Uh, he was a very effective head of civil engineering. He went on to be associate dean of engineering. 
and uh, was a very effective in that role as well. Sure, right, okay. And here with Michael, when I think of him, I think of the uh, program, the road show. <laughs> a quintess, quintessent uh, Uja, uh, and uh, an effective school head. Uh, he understood was the head for a long time, wasn't he? Yes, he was, and he was. He understood uh, both Purdue and the Indiana culture very well, and uh, knowing that is very important. In fact, some of these leaders that they're bringing in from outside now, which is, seems to be the the way things are going, uh, suffer from that from lack of that knowledge. Yeah, and he uh, he did some good things. Uh, was obviously a trip. Uh, an esteemed expert in his field of transportation. Let me ask you about the road show. That was going before he... Road school? Road school. Oh, yeah. it's been, and it still goes on. Oh, it, sure, it, It's right. an effective educational uh, tool, uh, shall we right. say. It, it brings all the elements of a transportation-related community together in uh, education, uh, hallway conversations that wind up policy, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, of course, he was involved in that from day one. Sure, yes. right, okay. Um, what the facilities, um, they've changed over. You've got more labs and research, and then talk about the Bowen. Well, <clears throat> when I first came here, there was physical large-scale research and structural engineering had kind of fallen out of popularity, uh, out of favor, I guess you would say. And uh, then... It uh, gradually picked up again, and uh, actually I, I had a role in that uh, with some of the w early work, research work I did. But uh, the bottom line is that the laboratory that we had was actually the original part of the Civil Engineering Building, uh, dating back to the early 50s. Uh, soon, uh, it, it was inadequate for a number of years. We added on to it. Uh, but it was just, uh, what, what can I say, it was just a uh, short-term solution no, and not really a solution. Yeah, it helped. You really it helped, not what we really needed. Sure. Fortunately, oh, I think it's about nine years ago, so roughly, uh, it was possible to build that new wonderful Bowen Laboratory, which is one of the half dozen best in the country now for large-scale research. And it was done at a very reasonable price. Uh, price tag was $10, $11 million, which is not very big tag for something like that. Mm -hmm. It opened the door for uh, a whole lot of things that are go ongoing right now. Sure. Uh, it's had good leadership, and uh, uh, the structures faculty has remained strong. And uh, I'm really looking for them to accomplish a lot of things in the near future. Uh, for the researchers, it's not quite on campus, it's adjacent to campus. Yeah. Oh, it's only a couple of miles sure, away, exactly, and it's, right. and uh, you know, in the times past that have been a problem, but all these uh, graduate students have cars now and so forth, so that's, an, and it's easy to get back and forth for right. the faculty. That's right. In yeah. fact, the faculty, just about all of them have offices down there if they're doing any work down there at all. Sure. In, in fact, they're kind of nice retreats to get away from the... <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. ...to do some thinking. Yeah. Uh, advancement and development. That's really made changes since you've been here for all the schools in the university. Yes, uh, and you would expect that over time, I suppose. But uh, it's... Uh, by development, I don't know whether you mean development well, or raising money from outside. Raising, yeah, right. Well, uh, if... Uh, if you look at the way the university used to be funded when I first was involved in it, uh, it was about a third, a third, a third. A third from the state, a third from research, uh, a third from tuition and fees and stuff like that. But, but that has changed remarkably. First of all, the, the state's share of the total budget is significantly less now. and. The money has to come from somewhere, so more and more of it has to come from research. Now, uh, you know, the efforts in development were, I'll be generous and say modest, very modest, when you and I first started in this game. Uh, now it's essential. Yeah. And uh, 
significant contributions by successful alumni are what make these steps forward, like the Bowen Laboratory, which had three or four and, and another half a dozen uh, uh, less huge, but nevertheless, uh, you know, significant contr contributions. They, that, that laboratory, for an, for an example, was built entirely with donated funds. Okay? And, uh, you know, 10, 11 million bucks, big dollars. And uh, these, these development is a necessary part. Unfortunately, uh, the responsibility of the state in this is still unclear as far as I'm concerned. My feeling is is that uh, the state ought to recognize that higher education, especially at top quality schools, is an important priority. Yeah. Well, I think we talked a little bit about that um, pancake breakfast, but that's changed. Remember, you, I it's changed, but that. you know, it's, I, it it, it hasn't gone have, away, and no. I think it may have come back with this Good. anniversary thing. I don't know. We'll sure. see. Yeah. But it it. it well, used to be during it used to be during Gala Week, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, well, they, well, they, they mean, don't do it the same way anymore. That's right. Now it's, it's be, the now it's become Race Week, you know. And exactly. <laughs> I okay. Right. Yeah. Um, Faculty tell us about uh, what call were you a faculty? Well, fellow? I was actually it's one of the things I did over the time, but mm -hmm. for a few years I was a fac fellow down at McCutcheon Hall, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it uh, it was a chance f to interact with and to get a picture of uh, how undergraduates think. Uh, you know, speaking on a little bit broader base, the the face of the campus has changed, and I I give credit to those leaders, starting with Freehafer and Ford and the rest, mm -hmm. who uh, correctly saw, in the presidents, of course correctly saw that it wasn't going to be necessarily prudent to invest large sums of money in a whole fleet of dormitories. So basically Purdue uh, dumped off the housing for upper level undergraduates and graduate students into the private sector. And I've been, again, I've been around to a number of universities and believe me, the housing for students at the undergraduate, upper level undergraduate and, and graduate level uh, is in the private sector is outstanding and it's, and it's quite close and they've solved the problem of transportation by providing, uh, hooking up with the Greater Lafayette Transportation Corp and, and providing free bus service as a part of the tuition fee. It's, it's, an, it's a good system. I think it's working very well. Right, exactly. But it was sort of nice when you could go over to the residence halls and have dinner with them in the same They facility. still exist. and they, Well, they have, many of the residence halls don't have the eating facilities in there anymore. No, they don't. But uh, Oh, you can the, still the, do it, but it was you nice can still the do it, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, it, I, they have gone to these uh, really quite excellent cafeteria oh, system. Oh, sure. The and uh, and, and uh, that's, not again, not peculiar to Purdue. Uh, and these kids have, what can we say, higher level tastes than, than we had uh, when we were younger, and uh, it, it, it responds to that. Oh, yeah, and so, right. uh, it, uh, it, but, you know, they, again, things have changed. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the dorms that they have built, uh, some of them cater, frankly, to upper income types. Uh, sure, right. Some of them are more yeah. pedestrian. We were we were back all over Tarkington for a number of years, and we did um, gave some programs over there, and they had things in the winter, so it was and it was close. It was easy to get back and forth, you know. So. Big universities like Purdue are struggling with how to keep them personal. Uh, there was even an article in the paper today that I'm sure you saw that. Uh, uh, the, the struggle when there's larger class sizes, everything is bigger, bigger, bigger. Uh, costs are forcing these some of these things. Uh, maintaining a personal touch is always going to be a, sure. a difficult thing to accomplish. Sure. And has been and continues. Uh, yeah, continues. It's going to get sure. worse because the bigger the groups, the more people get isolated. You know? Right. Um, family? Oh, I, uh, I'm married to... Uh, well, for almost, uh, not quite 53 years, 52 and so on, 53, let me think, 
no, 52 and change. Uh, I have to think. Uh, we were married in 60, and this is 12, so I guess it's 52. <laughs> I can do that math. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, my wife is, uh, uh, is from my home state of Rhode Island, and she's from Woonsocket, but, uh, you know, I'm from East Providence. But uh, we met, blind date, and uh, actually dated while I was a grad student here. Got married shortly after I got my degree. And uh, actually, uh, my daughter Cheryl was born nine months later, which tells you that it was a successful honeymoon. But uh, the thing is, is that uh, we've had two children. Uh, both of them uh, are Purdue grads. Uh, my my daughter has a bachelor's and a master's in education, and actually she's actually back teaching now. She's married to uh, Mark Beach, who is uh, an analytical chemist, a senior scientist at uh, Dow Chemical Company in Midland, Michigan, and they've lived in and raised their children in Midland, Michigan. They have three children, the oldest of which is a, now a grad student in civil engineering at uh, the University of Illinois, but his undergraduate degree is from Michigan State. My granddaughter, uh, middle ch Gerald's middle child, is at Michigan State in uh, business. And uh, her youngest, Jared, is a senior in high school, and he's going to Michigan State. So, uh, On the other hand, my son, Scott, is uh, also a Purdue grad, uh, construction engineering and management. And uh, he has worked f for Bechtel in a major construction company, Gilbane, and then was on his own. And now he has his own business and is very successful in uh, kind of a specialized uh, niche of uh, property development and things like that. One of his major clients for is MetLife, and, uh, but he has other clients. He's done very well. Where is he his located? He is, he's located in Elmhurst, and okay. he has, he's married to, uh, his wife is uh, Becky Cronin, is a uh, St. Mary's grad, that school across the street from ND, and uh, she, uh, they have three children. Their oldest, Megan, is uh, uh, at now at the University of Michigan. She, they all three went to Immaculate Conception High School in, in, in uh, the other two. Uh, you know, I, I always tell people, I, I used to really have clearly defined hates, you know, Michigan, uh, not so much Michigan State, but so it's getting, and Notre Dame, uh, it's getting hard to know who to hate anymore. <laughs> the list is closing. <laughs> but uh, the other two, uh, both Sean and uh, Matthew are younger. Sean's a junior in high school at Immaculate Conception, and uh, Matt's in, I guess, his seventh grade or eighth, seventh grade. And uh, they all, knock on wood, all of my grandchildren are good students, and uh, Megan is a super excellent student. She got uh, support to go to the University of Michigan, the outstanding business school. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they're going to be self-supporting. Sounds good. <laughs> you sound you're okay. <laughs> Some of your uh, awards, and uh, we'll talk a couple, one of the one that uh, Medal of Honor at the Precast, Pre-Stressed Concrete, and you've been involved with that. Uh, got a, nice. uh, this has been a... Uh, an important, very important activity in my career. Okay. I belong to all the uh, significant professional associations that relate to uh, st structural engineering, especially with a concrete emphasis, structural concrete emphasis. But I decided to devote my attention to one because I've always had, always had heavy teaching and so forth responsibilities and I couldn't get away as much, so I just focused on PCI. Precast Pre-Stressed Concrete Institute. Got involved in 72 at the behest of a former, of an alum, Bill Creasel, and stayed with it. Was on committees, got asked to serve, got asked to serve, and over the years I've served as chair of the Technical Activities Council, the uh, Research and Development Council for five years, and then now I'm chair of the Education Council. I've been on the board of directors for I think 12 of the last 13 years or something like that, which is extremely unusual. Uh, and so I've, when you stay there and work hard enough, you get recognitions, and I've had a few of them, including the Medal of Honor. Sure. Where are their, uh, their headquarters? 
Ch Chicago. Oh, okay. But okay. It, it's uh, the pre PCI is, is the organization. Uh, it's a technical slash trade association. It is the organization for major precast, pre-stressed concrete products and precast in general. Right. And uh, so if you see a bridge, it's got uh, concrete girders and it's at all new. Chances are those are being made by a PCI certified. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, the um, College of Engineering's Faculty Award of Excellence for advising. Well, I, I think we talked a little last time about that, but uh, the nice. uh, that way I, I received a Ross Judson Buck Award a couple of times too. Uh, the counseling system was set up in the early 70s, and so that uh, I had several counselees being instructors all the time, 12 and 13, and mm -hmm. some of the students over the years like the advice I gave them. Uh, <laughs> some of them even said, I didn't like hearing it at the time, but <laughs> you were right. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Okay. Um, and you're in the, uh, uh, the what's that Harold Munson Outstanding Teacher Award? You got that quite a few times. That's in the, I, the school? Uh, the, 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 this is a teaching award. Okay. And, uh, Essentially, uh, th that is a civil engineering school award. I won that four times. Mm -hmm. or, or I shouldn't say won. I've received that four times. Uh, received the Edmund Burke Award, the Roy Wansick Award, and then the... Uh, you got the Charles P. The Murphy Potter, Award. You got the, the award. Yes. Right. Uh, the the Potter, Potter Award, award which right. is the all engineering equivalent of the counseling award. And, and then finally, the... Uh, the biggie, I guess. Yeah. Huh? Was Dean, Dean Potter was alive when you came? Did you ever? Did yes, you say, he was did, alive. Did you? He was alive, but I don't. I think he was a dean for the first year or two that I was here. When exactly he went off, I don't know. Yeah, I forget now. I'd have to. I'd have to look that up. But uh, obviously, a legend. And he sort of took an interest. There were pictures they used to see him with his cane when the Potter Building was being, you know, the engineering building. He. Uh, he was a very important stabilizing force for engineering during that transition time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the deans have been generally pretty good leaders. Mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, again, recently when they've started bringing in people from outside, I think they've ha always had learning curves that uh, may have been uh, compromised their performance a little bit, at least at first. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what can I That's say? Not, that occurs, right, okay. Um, and you're also a fellow in the Teaching Academy, which is nice. Yes, that's the thing. You know, when you receive the, when you receive the Charles Murphy Award, which is the old university top teaching award, undergraduate teaching award, you automatically get your name put up on a plaque downstairs. I think here. that's a wonderful award. I really do. You know, yeah, there's that one picture where the little, 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 he must be under five, looking for grandpa. Cause it, and it's random. Yeah, it and is. It, it, it is kind wonderful. Of, you it's have to search. Than, that's right. And and that forces you to look at other names of exactly. people you know. And you have to know where you are, so that when you're showing somebody, you're not spending hours. For, I can't remember where I'm located. I've been there. <laughs> that. Uh, uh, look, it's that. nice to receive awards, but you know what I think is uh, more important is that. Uh, Throughout my career, there was a spirit of co collegiality here, and, and teaching was recognized as a valued activity, right. and at too many universities, it, that's in decline, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, any, you know, you remember the American Society of Civil Engineering, actually? Yes, yeah, ASCE and AC, yeah. uh, American right. Society of Civil Engineers, American Concrete Institute, and I sure. did chair a committee on that years back, but like I said, I had to make a choice, and it, sure. I was getting involved with PCI, and I liked the tone. The thing I liked about PCI, and I think this is important for the record, is that it gave me, better than the others, a window into the world of, uh, the real world of right. engineered construction and work. Right. As Whereas with ACI, there were so many academics in, uh, involved, and the same with ASCE, that it tends to be tilted towards 
the academic side. I, I wanted the window into the real world, yeah. and so and they, I, I like that. Students benefit that way by uh, it. They, I, I believe like they that. did. Yes, sure. I sure, believe exactly. they did. Um, talk a little bit about some of your involvement with the community. You were going to mention that. Yeah, I. Uh, well, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, when my son was 10, 11 years old, they were needing baseball coaches. Uh, actually, when he was nine. So I started coaching baseball, and I wound up coaching baseball uh, in this community for 10 or 12 years, including Little League and Babe Ruth. And uh, actually, I even coached the uh, the high school JVs for the for the summer one year. Uh, it, it's been it was a wonderful thing for me. But what's been really been maybe even better is to watch those kids that I had when they were 12 year old. We went to the Final Four in the Little League, by the way, for in the state. Uh -huh. uh, to watch those kids become now 50 year old adults uh -huh. and to see what they've done with their lives. Which is not uncommon in this community. I mean, it's that's West Lafayette for you. But uh, uh, it, that's been kind of fun. Yeah. The other thing was, of course, the church. Uh, I heavily involved in f the facilities related work at the behest of our pastor. I'm a Catholic, and uh, <coughs> Father Don Hardebeck got me involved in the Hattai Austin Building Commission way back in the late 80s, and I still serve on that commission. And when we put a major addition onto uh, Blessed Sacrament Church back in the 90s, mid 90s, I wound up uh, <coughs> basically being, well, I was the owner's rep on that job, which meant I had to be there every day and watching the whole thing and served on the committee that developed the thing and we did it just the right way and the facility is good at, uh, to this day. I mean, it's met its meeting its needs very well. The same is true, frankly, for the, the Diocesan Building Commission where we bring a professionalism to the development of the facilities that the church needs. In your expertise. And, and, yes, yeah. and, and you know, there are architects and uh, whatever and, and on that, and constructors on that commission, and it really has helped the pastors because uh, oh, yeah. they they have to assume responsibilities, frankly, for which they're not educated or prepared. And with that kind of backup, we actually now have a, a facilities management guy who is an architect and have had for, I don't know, 10 years. And uh, invaluable people, both of them very good, by the way. Uh, it's been a wonderful activity right. for me. I, I still, But my wife doesn't like the fact that I have to drive to Kokomo on weekday nights in my late 70s, well, mid-70s. I'll say mid-70s. Okay, okay. Um, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition or an outstanding event in your life? Well, there have been a lot of things, some of which are gone that I thought were pretty neat. Well. Uh, the, uh, you remember when the seniors all used to wear these corduroy pants. Senior course, and they paint. Occasionally, you do see some still. The, the alums, I see some still wearing them. You, you know? do? You know, occasionally, I've seen them at the games. You know, not too often. That was a kind of a unique Purdue thing that obviously yeah. went the way. The of other thing that was changing. nice too was that the residence halls and the fraternities, when they for uh, homecoming, had the sheets, and you got awards. You know, twenty-five dollars, yeah. and many of the community would take their children and drive around and see all those. It was really nice, you know. Well, you know, they, this this campus was a lot. Favorite story, a kid came to me, he was only a junior or so, and he hadn't had many courses. And, Look, we want to put a suspension bridge up for, it was for homecoming and weekend, you know, over, over there at one of the houses. Wait a minute, he said, you got to tell me how to die. <laughs> Fear and trepidation were the words. Well, this guy's name was Otto, actually called him Chuck Guidelhofer, and he's now a senior principal in a major consulting firm in Chicago and has done real stuff for a long while. He, and that's he, Purdue for you. Did he uh, put the... Oh, yeah, they, they put it up. And, uh, you know, I was sure glad when that weekend was over. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. Oh. <laughs> um, what are you doing in retirement? Care of well, you know, it's 
we did some traveling, and uh -huh. we've been to Europe and around various places. But uh, uh, we've, uh, I've continued my activities with PCI. Like I say, I'm still sure. on the board, and I'm on the board of directors of the foundation, PCI Foundation. So I'm, I'm, I have enough work for that that it's almost a quarter-time job. Uh, I was playing some golf until I hurt my back <laughs> a little bit, and uh, uh, it, you know, it's it's. Dick Gray said it the best. He said, you know, when you uh, when you retire, you realize all of a sudden your week consists of six Saturdays and a Sunday, which is an interesting observation that's commonly made. Uh, the other thing is, is that, and this is a true statement, is that uh, when you retire and you've been retired for a while and you have some things going on, you begin to wonder how you had time to, to work. I know. I hear you. Okay. Um, civil engineering in, is a course of study in the 21st century. In your own, any comments? Well, yes, I have views on that, and they're pretty simple, and I think... Okay. I, I, frankly, I think they're underemphasized in the, in the, uh, shall we say, the, in the education and everything else of uh, of kids. When they teach history and so forth, they tend to teach about the wars and uh, all that stuff, <coughs> and the political leaders and learn the names of all the presidents and the emperors and whatever. And. Uh, they overlook the thing which I think is critical in the development of civilizations, which is the infrastructure. Uh, not just transportation either, although that's probably is maybe the most important, but uh, all of the public infrastructure, including that in the private sector, like buildings and what have you, all of that is civil engineering. Water treatment, uh, water, in, uh, providing water, uh, uh, all of those resources. Well, look at the, the Roman wall, the Hadrian Wall. I yeah, mean, yeah. It, 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 and the reason that Rome the succeeded so Europe. much is their road system. And, and you know, these this is underemphasized. And for as long as I was in civil engineering, it was always kind of a, I won't say a stepchild, but uh, some of the other branches of engineering kind of looked on their noses, just so they're not overtly, but a little bit at uh, that, well, you know, is there anything more important than the technology that underpins infrastructure development? Not for me, there isn't. And uh, if, if we don't have uh, transportation systems, and I mean the full range, airports, they're designed and built civil engineering. Uh, roads, bridges, railroads, yeah. fast trains, you name it, it's all civil engineering. And uh, the thing is, I think that's either overlooked or taken for granted by too many people. Do I think that civil engineering will be an important branch of engineering in the future? Absolutely. As it has been in the past. As it has been. I mean, it's, it's, it's if you have to identify, as important as all our, our information technology is, and you, it's hard to overemphasize it, as important as ma manufacturing is, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there is nothing more critical than our, than our infrastructure system. I agree. And uh, so I think it's always going to have a role, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, the reason it's kind of, uh, it, uh, attitudes among other engineers can be kind of dismissive at the time because it's viewed as kind of pedestrian. Well, it isn't as easy as it looks. <laughs> it isn't as easy to successfully design a major bridge. Takes lots of science and technology, and to intelligently design a, a transportation system takes a lot of science and technology. And when you are designing the foundations for 75-story building takes a lot of science and technology. And I think it will, I don't see it going away. No, I don't either, <laughs> right. Anything that I forgot to ask or any even closing that you'd like to make? I, you know, I, uh, all I can say is that, that uh, 
for me, this profession was a perfect fit well, for my personality and instincts and everything else. Uh, it had personal interactions with young people. Uh, had the chance, uh, afforded the opportunity to uh, uh, have an impact on the future. And I see it all the time in the students that I've had when I run into them in various pro right. professional settings. Uh, and uh, had a chance to serve in a, at a great university, and, and Purdue is a great university. Uh, frankly, I think its contributions have been taken for granted a lot of times because as I said last time, is people at Purdue have not had the instinct for uh, going out in the public square and trumpeting their accomplishments. And uh, maybe that's a little bit too bad. You know, if anything happens at Harvard, everybody knows about it tomorrow. Yeah. Whereas if it happens here, they may never hear about it. Yeah. But okay. I'm biased. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate it.